Romans chapter 6. So I want to talk about the subject of the grace of God, walking free in the glory of his grace. And I know we prayed before, so I want to take a few more moments and uh, pray some more. Uh, Father, we thank you for your glorious word. Father, thank you for your son. Father, thank you for the cross and thank you for your Holy Spirit who's in our midst, Lord, even this morning. Father, we ask you for an increased sense of your presence, Father, upon our hearts and upon our minds. Lord, we ask you that uh, you would open up our eyes, Father, to your law, to behold glorious and marvelous things. Father, we ask you even this morning, right now, Lord, that you would cause light and truth, Lord, to shine upon our hearts and upon our minds and give us insight into your holy heart through your word. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, we're living in uh, very interesting times, and, uh, this, uh, and more than ever, uh, there is a need to have uh, an understanding of this subject called the grace of God. Uh, the grace of God is, uh, in general, it's a concept that we are uh, familiar with in, in a very general sense in that it is the, uh, the free gift of God that is given to us. It's God's uh, unmerited favor uh, that is given to us uh, in the born-again experience, and it's ours through faith. And yet, the, one of the things that we see the apostles uh, caution us about uh, quite often uh, and we see this here in Romans 6, um, we see it in, in, in 2 Peter, we see it in Jude and other passages like it, where it is very easy to distort the message of God's grace into something other than what God's grace really is all about. And what God's grace is about, it's not just about God's unmerited favor in terms of his embrace and his love towards us that we cannot earn, but we receive it by faith. But it's also the, the release of God's power to actually thrust us into living holy lives. What I want to do this morning, I just want to take a few moments, and I'm not going to go through it line by line. I just want to give us just a brief overview of this, of this glorious passage. I have found myself in the last uh, uh, several weeks, just from my own personal life, just uh, giving myself to Romans 6, and it's just been uh, uh, full of surprises to me. It's as, as the Holy Spirit is just opening up my eyes, you know, to the truth of what Paul is saying. Now, one of the ways that you know that the spirit of revelation is touching you is when you read a chapter you've read before and you are convinced that there were a few extra verses added to it that weren't there the last time you read it. And, uh, and if that's your experience, uh, that's the spirit of revelation touching you. You go, wait a minute, I never read that verse before. Read it 20 times, but never saw that verse. And, uh, and I found that's been happening to me in a fresh way as I've been um, looking at this passage. You know, it's a passage about the freedom that we have in Christ. And, you know, we're living in very trying times. There is a pressure um, in, this, in this region, there's pressure I mean, this nation, this pressure in the nations of the earth, and, um, and then there's also, of course, our own personal pressures that we deal with, and I know I've had my fair share of personal pressures uh, here within the last year or so, and, and any time there are pressures that, that come our way, what happens is the, the weakness of our own souls actually get exposed, and I've found just the, uh, just the weakness of my own soul just exposed before the Lord uh, in the midst of not only the national, but just also just my own personal pressures. And I found that, the, that Romans chapter 6 is just a chapter that just uh, 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 invigorates and it empowers and it encourages our hearts uh, to go forth in the grace of God. You know, Jesus, when he um, uh, fasted for those 40 days, he wasn't tempted for 40 days. The temptation didn't come until at the end of the 40 days when he was tired. And that's when sin, which we're going to look at in this moment, that's when sin actually comes knocking at our door. It's when we are the, uh, when we are the most vulnerable. In fact, it even said that after Jesus resisted the temptation of Satan and actually says that Satan left him for a more opportune time. In other words, he's waiting for yet another time to, 
to see if he can engage Jesus again and, lure, and, and try to allure him into sin, which of course, praise God, he never did. But the point is, is that when we find ourselves uh, weak physically, weak emotionally because of the pressures of life, uh, that is when sin actually comes knocking on our door. And Romans chapter 6 just gives us a tremendous insight. In my opinion, it's the, one of the clearest passages um, in the New Testament to give us insight into the exchange that took place when you and I were born again. There is something marvelous, there's something wonderful that took place when you and I said yes to Jesus Christ. And different parts of the scripture tells us that you and I were members of, of an entirely different kingdom. We were members of the kingdom of darkness and then we were rescued from that kingdom and we were brought into the kingdom of the son of his love. We were in darkness and we were brought into his marvelous light. And, and Romans 6, just in my opinion, in just such a wonderful way, gives us uh, a, a more of a, uh, a, a, a closer view, a closer perspective, so we can have more insight into what exactly took place uh, when you and I were born again. And secondly, it also gives us tremendous insight into the the wonderful and the glorious benefits that we have um, in Jesus Christ so that we can live a life in a manner that is worthy of the Son of God. You guys have been looking at the subject of the Sermon on the Mount for the last several weeks, and, uh, and that is probably the, the clearest line upon line uh, description out of the words of Jesus Christ himself what it is that Christianity looks like both externally and internally. Now, what the enemy seeks to do, he seeks to distort the truth of the grace of God. He does this by way of warfare where he seeks to bring uh, lies uh, to our hearts and to our minds, and he also does this to, uh, through distorted teaching about the grace of God. Now, what is the distortion of the grace of God is this, is when we hear grace preached in such a way that it actually keeps us comfortable in our compromise. The, the true preaching of grace, what it does, it actually motivates and it actually inspires our heart to say yes to the Lord by faith at a deeper level and then to cooperate with the power that he's given to us to live in the way that he's called us to live as seen within the context of the Sermon on the Mount. There's a book called The End of Slavery in America, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. And in that book, there's this quote, it says that in many instances, slave owners tried to suppress the news of the proclamation, referring to the emancipation. And it says that some of these uh, slave owners, they actually were successful enough that their slaves learned absolutely nothing about the emancipation until the Union soldiers arrived, even after, and some even after the conclusion of the war. So here these slaves are in the plantation fields, and President Lincoln, he, um, he issues forth this uh, Emancipation Declaration, and the, uh, the slave owners, they knew about this declaration, but they tried to keep that information from the slaves. And in many cases, they, some were actually, were actually very successful in keeping the information from slaves. So here you have these slaves who are actually free by law, still operating as slaves because they did not know that they were free. And it wasn't until the Union soldiers showed up and said, hey, you've been free for quite a while, that they went, wait a minute, <laughs> what's going on? And then and they began walking in their liberty. And in the very same way, the enemy is, is doing the same thing uh, to the church, where there is a emancipation declaration that declares to us that because you and I are born again, that we are no longer slaves to sin, that sin is no longer our master, it is no longer our employer, we do not have to obey its mandates, we don't have to say yet, we don't have to... Um, uh, respond to his wooings, but that rather that we can respond to the grace of God and present ourselves to God as a life in the Lord Jesus Christ. I so said the enemy seeks to distort that reality, and that's a battle that, uh, that all of us face, and that's a battle that I face. And even as I've been looking at Romans 6 in these last couple of weeks, I'm going, wow, there are some real areas in my life where I still think of myself as a slave to sin, and it's really making life hard. But the moment you begin to discover that you're no longer, there is a, 
there's a courage, there's a strength, there's an inspiration that actually touches our heart to actually walk into greater dimensions of freedom at a heart level as the Lord has desires for us. Now, the Holy Spirit, he has a, a counterattack, and that is that he desires to, to teach you and I about the free things that we have in God through Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says that we have not received the spirit of this world, but, that the, uh, but, the, but we have received the spirit, the Holy Spirit that is from God, so that we may know, instead of know, it's 1 Corinthians 2.12, uh, 2, instead of saying no, so that we can understand, so we can have understanding of the things that were freely given to us by God. When you and I came into the born-again experience, beloved, you and I walked into the very wealth of heaven. And, and it takes the Holy Spirit to actually give us insight into the wealth that is in store from us uh, from above. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, he, he says that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing that is found in heavenly places. And one of the greatest joys that the Holy Spirit has is to open up the scriptures, Psalm 119 verse 18, that the Lord would open up our eyes to his law that we may see glorious and marvelous things. And, and so while the enemy is trying to uh, speak lies to our hearts and to our minds about this glorious truth and the, the, uh, the many benefits that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is sent from heaven by the Father and the Son to come alongside of us, the, uh, the great comforter, the great helper, to give us insight into the precious things that belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we begin to discover all the things that have been given to us freely if we would only receive it by faith. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 10, focuses on the emancipation. Whereas Romans chapter 6, verse 11 to 23 focuses on the implications. And so the first 10 verses tell us the, about the emancipation that we have in Christ, and then the remainder of the chapter tells us, now in light of this emancipation, here are the implications to our lives, and they are most glorious. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 10, Paul gives us the emancipation declaration, and he declares to us something absolutely amazing. He says that you and I are no longer subjects to the power of sin. We are no longer subjects to the power of sin. We are no longer slaves of sin. We are no longer employed by sin. We don't have to show up on Monday morning and report for duty. We are no longer its subjects. Now, the question, of course, is now, then if I'm a Christian, I'm born and I believe in it, why is it then that it feels like I am actually am a slave to sin? And I, I understand that question. I understand the, uh, uh, the storm of sin that hits us. And I'm going to talk in just a few moments a little bit more what I mean by sin in, in terms of the context of Romans chapter 6. But I know what it's like to, to feel uh, dark emotions uh, hit uh, uh, my mind and hit my being and sometimes you just want to just, I don't know, just peel the flesh off your bones and go like, ah, this is intense. And Paul is not suggesting that we don't have that war. What he is saying is that because of the born again experience, we no longer have to respond to that storm when it hits us. Before we were saved, when the storm was hit us, when we would get hit, say with anger, we had no recourse but to let it take its full course. But now in Christ, when, when the temptation of anger would hit us, we are no longer bound to actually obey its, uh, uh, its mandates. That's what he means by the fact that we are, are free uh, from sin, that we're no longer under sin. In the last several weeks, as I said, I've been looking at Romans 6, and I just found my own heart just uh, strengthened and encouraged us in a whole in a whole renewed way, just as the Lord is just, uh, uh, just laying my heart bare before him, saying, hey, son, there are areas in your heart that I would like to, and, uh, 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 I, I want to form the image of my son in your heart in a greater way. You know, one of the areas is in, is in the areas of my patience. He says, look, I want to form in you the, uh, the patience of my son, that when the impulses to, to be impatient hit you, you need to understand, son, that you don't have to, 
uh, you don't have to ride the wave. You don't have to go on a joyride of that, of that impulse. That impulse is no longer your boss. I'm like, ah, oh, that is so true. It's no longer my boss. Wow, that's really cool. And when we begin to get convinced of the fact that these impulses of darkness are no longer our bosses, there is courage that actually strikes our heart to actually begin to resist it in the grace of God. The key issue in the first 10 verses of Romans chapter 6, uh, six verse 10, the key issue is the, it is the importance to know or the importance to understand. Paul, on three occasions, he highlights this issue of knowing. In fact, in verse 3, he starts out. He says in verse 1, he says that, he says, what then shall we say? In light of this, shall we sin because we're no longer under the law but under grace? He said, far be that from the truth. We cannot do that. We must not continue in sin. He goes, how can those who have died to sin continue in it? And in verse 3, he says this, or do you not know? He hits the issue of understanding in verse 3. Later on in verse 6, he says the same thing, that he says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified. In verse 8, excuse me, in verse 9, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead and never to die again, he, on three occasions, he tells us that we must know this. And so the, the first step to walking free in the glory of God's grace is actually knowing and understanding the terms of our emancipation. I'm going to say this again, that the first step to walking free in the grace of God is by actually knowing and understanding that we have been declared free from the bondage of sin from the very throne of God. And that's the thing that Paul is highlighting for us in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, that we, we want to become familiar with his truths. And like I said, just in the last couple of weeks, I've just been, you know, I've been, I've been challenged in my own heart going, man, I need to spend more time uh, you know, more times a year revisiting the terms of this emancipation because my heart has just been pleasantly surprised and just in a renewed way going, wow, Lord, you really have freed us from the power of sin. There is a way to live life that is above the clouds, so to speak, and living victorious against the uh, various things that come against our hearts uh, as, uh, as we go through life. And so again, the first step is that we must know that we understand uh, that we have insight into uh, this uh, glorious emancipation. And Paul wants the believers to understand. Here, here's what he wants us to understand. Here's what he wants us to know in the first 10 verses. He wants to understand that because of the born-again experience, you and I are baptized in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what it means to be baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ, it means that we have been brought into union with him, that we were made one with him, that we were immersed into the very personhood of Jesus Christ. And that because you and I, in the born-again experience, uh, came into union with the Son of God, that as he died, so we also died, and that as he was raised from the dead, so you and I were brought into the newness of life. And so because we are one with Christ and because he died, you and I, because of the born-again experience, are as he have died as well, we are dead to sin. And what it means to be dead, it simply means that we know when something is dead, it means that it can't respond to any outside influences. And so when he says that we are dead to sin, it means that you and I no longer have to respond to the outside force of evil that comes against us, and that storm is actually very real. And we'll just talk in just a few moments about, uh, about the importance of, of resisting that storm. But here's the point I'm trying to make. When Paul, uh, on three occasions, tells us that we need to know the emancipation, he repeats what it is that we need to know all three times. And there's three things we need to understand. Number one, he goes, I'm emphasizing this, Paul says. I want you to know this. You need to be convinced of this. He says, be convinced of the fact that you and I are united with Christ Jesus, that when we were born again, as it says in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 17, that he who has been joined with the Lord is one spirit with him, that you and I are united uh, in Christ, in God, by the Holy Spirit, even now as you and I are sitting in these chairs Secondly, he wants us to know that we are dead, that 
uh, that we don't have to respond anymore uh, to the wooings and the allurement of sin. And thirdly, that we are alive in God, that the very life, the very power, uh, the very majesty that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that very power lives and it resides inside of you and me. And Paul says, I want you to know this. And one of the verses that comes to my mind is in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, and Paul had just said, I pray for the church of Ephesus. He says, I pray that you would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation. And then in verse 19, he says that you would know the exceeding greatness of his power that is towards us who believe the very power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and ascended him uh, uh, through the heavens far above powers and principalities. And when I read that, I go, wow, that's a lot of power. Not only did it raise Jesus from the dead, it actually transformed his entire body from an immortal body, from a mortal body into an immortal body. He walked on the earth for 40 days. That same power caused him to be ascended into the very heavens. You know, the, the, the apostles sitting there going, whoa. I mean, they were so captivated by this thing. An angel finally came to us and says, hey, what are you looking at, you know? And then, uh, he says, hey, he's coming back the same way he went. Go, go preach the gospel. Like, oh, yeah, that's right. You know, I mean, it was, I mean the power that ascended him um, into the very heavens, far above powers and principalities, Paul says that same power is towards you and I who believe. He says, and I pray that you would have revelation. And, that's, and, and Paul is saying something... Um, He's saying the same thing in a different word in Ephesians chapter 1 and in Romans chapter 6. He's saying, look, you have been made alive uh, through Christ in God, and I want you to know this. Three occasions he emphasizes this church of Jesus Christ. Know this. Be convinced of this. Your former slave master, he has a strategy to suppress your mind and to suppress our hearts and to keep this information from us. But God has sent us the Holy Spirit to come alongside us and to give us insight and to help us and to, and to teach us this truth. And so one of, the, one of the prayers that we want to pray is say, Holy Spirit, give me insight of what it means to be dead to sin and alive to God. The next step is found in verse, uh, verse 11. In verse 11, he says, even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so the first 10 verses, he wants us to know and to understand. That's the first step. But in, the, uh, but in verse 11, he wants us to do something else. He wants us to not only know and understand, he actually wants us to consider. He wants us to think about this. we go, hmm, man, if this is true, what does this mean about me? And begin to rethink think the way that we see ourselves. The studies show that we think, you know, anywhere between 50,000, excuse me, 12,000 to 50,000 thoughts a day, depending how active your mind is, I guess. And, uh, and it says that 80 to 90 percent of those thoughts are negative, that you and I actually have a propensity towards negativity. And so it is not natural for us to see ourselves in this light. It is not natural for us to to see ourselves as dead to sin and alive to God. It's something that's completely contrary to the way that we think, and it is contrary to the lies that the enemy um, is whispering in, a, uh, 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 in our hearts and in our minds. But Paul says, I want you to consider yourself, though, in light of this information, he goes, I want you to see yourself differently. He goes, it is important that you see yourselves as ones who are dead to sin. In other words, as ones who no longer have to respond uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the wounds of sin, to the wounds of darkness. Even this morning, I was telling the last services, I was uh, uh, getting ready for, an, um, uh, 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 for, uh, for this morning. I, uh, you know, I was just doing my thing, and, and then all of a sudden, somebody's name popped into my mind. And, and out of nowhere, I began to have an attitude. It's like, is, is, is that ever happened to anyone, you know? Okay, the rest of you, I'll tell you later how that works. But anyway, but I'm over there, you know. This person pops into my mind, and I have an attitude. Oh, not only do I have an attitude, I have a court case in my mind, and I'm, like, totally winning, you know. And, and, um, and, and I just stop right in my I go, Stuart Green. So I said, that's anger. That's what that is. I, it's a, you, it, 
that's not good. And, but, and, but I was studying Romans 6, so I was in good company. You know, so I was able to say, hey, I said, anger. I says, I'm no longer employed by you. It says, you are no longer my master. And then what I can do is I can then present myself alive to God. I can, I can say, no, it says, no, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to go on that joyride. I've been on that joyride before, and it's bad. I want my money back anyway. And, uh, and, and then I, <laughs> and I just present myself to God. I say, Lord, I love you. I don't want to feel this way. Would you cause your life to begin touching me? And, I was able, and then you're able to pray for that individual as well. It is essential in considering ourselves that we actually make the decision to begin thinking about ourselves differently, that we begin to see ourselves as those who are alive to God and dead to sin. It takes courage to do this. It takes courage to believe in freedom. Uh, to be a free person actually takes courage because the moment we are free or actually begin to experience the freedom that we have in Christ, um, it actually takes our life and into a completely different direction and, and, and actually takes us almost like into the place of the unknown. It's a place of joy and peace, but there are many, many surprises that come along with a journey as well. And so the second step to freedom, the first one is to put ourselves in a position to know and to understand. And the second is that we would consider ourselves, that we see ourselves in a different light. And one of the prayers that I've been praying, say, Holy Spirit, would you help me see myself in a different light? Holy Spirit, would you help me see myself as dead to sin and alive to God? Because as I mentioned earlier, it is not natural for us to think that way. It is, we think the opposite. We actually tend to think of ourselves. We actually tend to define ourselves actually about the very weakness that attacks us on a regular basis. And this is something that I've seen over and over and over again. I've seen people uh, struggle with sin. They're wrestling with sin. They're not giving in. But the moment they consider themselves according to the thing that they're battling with, the battle is over. And they actually get themselves over to that sin. And they actually begin to carry it out by way of their actions. And so we want to go on a journey to ask the Holy Spirit, the Lord, would you renew our minds? This, this takes Holy Spirit activity uh, through the Word to begin changing the way uh, that we think. And it happens over time. The true understanding of the grace of God, what it does, it actually causes us to consider uh, 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 um, the way that we think about ourselves. The true understanding of God's grace, it brings us into that place of considering or thinking of ourselves in a different way. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a real distortion about the message of grace that kind of says, well, you know, the Lord, you know, just kind of loves you just as you are. And, you know, and then one says it's true, he loves us the way we are, but he also loves us enough not, he also loves us enough not to leave us the way that we are. And that is the full message of God's grace is that he, he wants to form uh, us into the likeness and the image of his son. It is too glorious of a truth to ignore that when we give ourselves to the subject of the grace of God, it actually thrusts us forward into wholeheartedness as defined by the Sermon on the Mount. Now, before we continue, I just want to give a, a brief uh, definition of sin and grace. In order to uh, more effectively understand uh, Romans chapter 6, I just want to take this real briefly and look at the issue of sin. Now, when Paul says sin, it's a very important to note that he doesn't say sins, which usually when the Bible talks about sins, it is actually talking about our actions. But when it's talking about sin, it's talking about this force. It's talking about this power. It's talking about this curse, this evil uh, that comes against us. And Paul uses the word singular, sin. So he says we are no longer under, uh, 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 we're no longer slaves. We're no longer subjects to this evil that comes against us. And it really does come against us. Where uh, many Christians get confused is that they go, hey, wait a minute. If I'm free from sin, then why am I still feeling some of these things that come against me? And Paul didn't say, look, he didn't say that we won't feel those things. He says, no, we need to arm ourselves for war because there's a real battle that comes against us. He says the only difference is that now because we're born again, uh, we don't have to succumb to, uh, 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 succumb to those pressures. This is reminiscent of what the Lord told Cain. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, he says that sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, 
but you must master it. And that's a very interesting uh, 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 picture that here he says sin is like this. It's, it's a stalker. It's intentional. It has a strategy. It has focus. It is determined. And it will pounce you. And it is crouching at your door. That's the first thing he said. He said the second thing he says, and its desire is for you. It says this thing wants you badly. It is filled with cravings, and it won't stop at anything to have you. And the Lord tells Cain, but here's the issue. He says, you must master it, and therein lied our problem before we came to Christ. Before we came to Christ, this thing was crouching at our door. It was waiting for an opportune time. It would pounce on us, and we find ourselves doing saying and feeling things that we did not even like, even before we were saved. We're going, this is, this is horrible, but there's nothing I can do about it. And the Lord said, you must master it. You, you go like, I can't. And because we couldn't, that's when condemnation came in. But in Christ, he says, this thing is still crouching at our door. It is still desiring us. But now, because we're no longer under sin, we actually have the power of God's grace to actually master that thing in our lives by the grace of God. Now, this is good news. It really is. It won't happen without a battle, but it really is good news. When we, and the more we consider ourselves as free, the more we uh, ask the Spirit to help us to see ourselves in a different light, because we really do act according to the way that we see ourselves. And we, must ask the, we must ask for that Holy Spirit activity on a regular basis and say, Lord, would you change the way that I see myself. Lord, I want to see myself the way that you see me. Father, how do you see me? And I imagine him saying, son, I see you as dead to sin, but alive to me. And said, so, Father, you cannot tell me that enough. He goes, well, you just keep asking me, and I'll keep telling you until you are fully convinced of this. And the Holy Spirit wants to help us in that reality. So being under sin means that you and I were not able to master its influence coming against us. Now, what does grace mean? Grace, in its simplest terms, is God's unmerited favor and power to live a godly life. It's God's unmerited favor and power to live a godly life. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, that's my favorite definition of grace. Romans 6 is my favorite uh, breakdown of how grace operates. But uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, is my favorite definition. Uh, definition of grace, and Paul says that God's grace, um, that he says, for the grace of God or the power of God, it does two things. It, it brings salvation, number one, and number two, it teaches us to deny ungodliness, to deny worldly lust, and it teaches us how we should live with sobriety, righteousness, and godliness in this present age. And this is the part of the grace of God that often gets overlooked. And one of the things that I'm realizing is I am looking at Romans 6 just through these, uh, these new lenses and these fresh eyes. I'm realizing how invasive and how zealous and how decisive the grace of God is. That the grace of God actually will not leave you comfortable with areas of compromise in your heart, it will not leave you comfortable. It will make you incredibly uncomfortable when grace actually comes knocking on your door. A lot of people think it's the opposite. A lot of people think that grace makes you comfortable. And not according to Titus, he says grace actually comes alongside and it begins to teach and it begins to instruct of how we can live with sobriety. In other words, that we can live connected with reality and it teaches us how to deny, how to resist um, evil in our lives and how to live righteously and godly in this present age. And so grace has a teaching ministry of how to live out the Sermon on the Mount. In Romans chapter 6, verse 12, he says, therefore, so in verses 1 to 10, he says, I want you to know and understand this. In verse 11, he says, I want you to consider this. And he says, now, in verse 12, he says, in light of this, I want you to no longer have sin reign in your mortal bodies. Instead, present yourself to God. And so we do two things, with three things we know, we consider, and we present. Know, consider, and present. 
in light of our glorious emancipation in the gospel, uh, Paul calls believers to resist sin by not letting sin run its course in our lives. Like this morning, you know, I, it, it, you know, when the impulse, you know, when that court case, you know, it's a, it was a good court case. There's cameras and everything. I mean, you know, you know, as, as the court case began growing in my mind and I began to feel justified in my attitude, there's a certain sense of like, well, you know, this really kind of feels good, kind of, sort of. And it is very easy to go and I joyride, and, and, I'm, and I'm remembering the words of Paul. He says, no. He says, don't let that thing have leadership in your life. Just don't let it reign. Don't let it take the reins of your life and take you on a course because you're not going to like the end of this road. He goes, you want to get off that joyride. He goes, do not let it reign in your life. And, you know, and I can imagine us going, but Lord, it's so powerful. And the Lord says, yes, but remember Remember who you are, boy. He says, you are dead to sin. He goes, you are my son. He goes, I'm alive in my father. You are my son. You are as I. You are united with me. He consider, he goes, see yourself in a different light. He goes, you are a part of a different family. You're no longer a part of the family of darkness. You have been brought into the kingdom of the son of my love. You have a new identity. And that identity is that you are dead to sin. You can say no to that anger and then present yourself to me and talk to me and let me empower you by my grace. When we present ourselves, when I, when, I, when I read the phrase when he says, do not present yourself, I think of, you know, when, you know, when we're presenting ourselves for duty, he says, don't present yourselves for duty to your old boss. He goes, don't do it. He said, he's a really bad boss. You don't want to do it. You know, one of the things that and, um, uh, I battled in my life uh, over the years because of the, all the different places where I've lived, I actually battled with chronic loneliness. And when loneliness began to take its course in my heart, it just opened up this door to all kinds of things. And so even to this very day, there are things that are not, they're not even bad things. There are things that I just need to stay away from because the moment I engage them, it actually inflames this thing within my heart again. And I am like, you know, two, three, four, five weeks out from a really bad mood, let the reader understand. And so we don't want to present ourselves to anything that uh, uh, that would inflame sin in our members. And so we want to know, we want to consider, and we want to resist by, uh, by doing two things. One, by saying to that area, say, no, you are no longer my master. I, I belong to another, and we present ourselves to God. And secondly, we want to present ourselves by not putting ourselves in situations or use words or think thoughts or put things in front of our eyes that actually cause sin to actually engage our lives. I can tell people all the time, you know, if you're an alcoholic, you don't want to go buy gum at a liquor store. Sin is no longer our master because we are no longer under the law. We are no longer, except the worship team come up, we are no longer under the requirement to obey God in our own strength. We're no longer under that requirement. We are under grace. Because of the work of Christ Jesus, we now by faith are enjoyed by God and we are in union with Christ. And this whole issue of being enjoyed by God is critical because as we are discovering our emancipation in Christ Jesus, it is very easy to feel condemned when we fall short in the journey. Beloved, I've got good news for us this morning that if we are sincere believers, serious about God, serious about obeying his ways, serious about embracing grace, and as we go forward but we stumble along the way, the good news is that even though we stumble, we are profoundly and deeply enjoyed by God. And it gives us the courage to rise up like it says in the Proverbs, it says that a Righteous man falls seven times, but the wicked, they stumble in a time of calamity. Again, if we are sincere and we are wholehearted about going after the things of God, 
in our immaturity, because we don't fully understand the implications of what it means to be free, we stumble, we, we run into our weakness, and though we run into our weakness, we must understand that God's smile is upon us, and it gives us the courage to run towards him instead of running away from him. Under grace, we rest fully in the work of Jesus on the cross. We experience his uh, free grace towards us as we present ourselves alive to him in fellowship. One of the ways, one of the primary ways, or one of the easiest ways that we present ourselves to God in grace is by talking to him. We walk in grace by talking to God, by talking to the Spirit. It really all comes down to just having set aside just that regular time, whatever that, whatever that looks like for you, but just that regular time just to sit before the Father and to thank him for his love and to thank him for his grace and then to ask him for um, his power uh, to touch us, uh, 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 to ask him to, to teach us how to walk more effectively I mean, his ways, like it says in the Psalms, it says, teach us your ways, O Lord, and we will walk in the truth. And then secondly, I encourage people to have several times throughout the day just to acknowledge the fact that the Holy Spirit actually lives inside of us. I have found that when I acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit living in me because of the born-again experience, that when I give myself to that regularly, that I begin to experience more of his grace upon my heart. I don't earn his grace, but what it does, it lines up our hearts with the free gift of God's grace that flows towards us. And so we want to give ourselves to knowing our emancipation. I want to encourage you to, to regularly study this passage. You're, this is your pastor's favorite passage and undoubtedly, it has several teachings on it. I encourage you to grab a hold of those, those teachings and study out the emancipation. Become familiar with it. Number two, ask the Holy Spirit to, to change the way that we see ourselves in light of that truth. And thirdly, we present ourselves alive to God by not putting ourselves in circumstances that cause the sin to be inflamed, by not using words that cause the sin to be inflamed, by not... An, uh, 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 putting things in front of our eyes that activate sin in our lives in a more aggressive way, and by giving ourselves a life to God, say, Lord, here we are, Lord, we are yours. Father, thank you for your life that is in me. Lord, I ask you as you bring life in my heart. Lord, I pray that where there is anger, even as I pray this morning, Lord, I pray, Lord, where there is anger, I pray you bring peace and joy and love. Father, we thank you, Lord. For your amazing grace. And thank you, Jesus, that you said that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Thank you, Lord, that we are free. Lord, that we can have victory in the midst of the battle. Father, I ask you for us this morning. Lord, I pray for Grace Church. I pray for myself and my family and my friends. Lord, that you would grant us the spirit of revelation. Lord, that we would know the exceeding greatness of your power that is towards us who believe. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.